This is the Unit 3 lecture. In this lecture, I'll be going over linear perspective and atmospheric perspective. So first, what is perspective? Perspective is the illusion of depth in a two-dimensional artwork. It helps us understand what point of view we are seeing the artwork from. In terms of the meaning of the word, perspective is Latin for to see through. Now, in the early days of Western art, the ultimate goal was to depict the picture plane as a window. This is the idea that illusion of depth is so convincing that the viewer can feel as though they are peering not at a drawing or a painting on canvas, but through a portal or a window. Perspective helps the viewer understand themselves in relation to space depicted on the picture plane. For example, when we see a work of art, do we feel like we're flying above the scene, down below the scene, or right in front of the scene? Western perspective is what we're the most familiar with in our culture. Western perspective and Western art really value realism, um, a scientific and mathematical approach to depicting space, and then also really values portraying a convincing illusion of three-dimensionality on a two-dimensional surface. It also values truth and rationality. During the Renaissance from roughly the 14th to the 16th century, there were many advances in science, math, philosophy, and art. One of the most monumental advances in art was the development of linear perspective, which is uniquely Western. Linear perspective uses principles of math to realistically portray space and depth in art. So this uniquely Western system for portraying perspective was mastered in Renaissance Europe. There are many other ways of indicating space aside from linear perspective, which cultures all over the world have mastered. I want to talk a little bit about some of the vocabulary words because I'll be bringing them up a lot in this project. So the basic idea in linear perspective is that when objects are receding in space, they all converge to a vanishing point. Um, you may notice in this picture that there are some really dramatic angles in, for example, the railroad, in the power lines, in the fence line. Now all of those angles are leading somewhere. So if we just follow them, they are all different angles, but they are all meeting here um, at one spot. Now this is called the vanishing point. The vanishing point oftentimes um, is going to be on the horizon line, but it can also be around the horizon line as well, depending on where it feels like you're standing or looking at the piece. Right, and I'm going to talk more about point of view later in the lecture. So the horizon line basically is just where the sky and the land meet. And oftentimes, but not always, the vanishing point lands on that horizon line. This is the ground plane. So the ground plane just refers to the earth, the ground, whatever um, surface that it appears that you're able to walk upon. So there are three categories of linear perspective, and the first one is one point. One point perspective is probably the easiest one to understand and to draw. This is a linear perspective that includes just one vanishing point near the horizon line. You can also tell um, that something is in one point perspective if the front if the front of an object is facing us directly. The most common object to draw when you're practicing linear perspective is a cube. Now if you see if you can see the front of the cube um, and that front is completely flat then oftentimes you can tell it's in one point perspective. So let's trace the converging lines. All right, Converging line goes here there's an angle here, it points to that vanishing point again, goes here, and it goes here. 
two-point perspective is the next category of linear perspective. So this includes two vanishing points on the horizon line. And you can tell that something is in two-point perspective when you're able to see two sides of an object. So with these cubes, you can see two very prominent sides. They might be different sizes, but you're, you're still able to see two at once. So if I follow the converging lines, some of the angles go in one direction, some of the angles go in a different direction. This is a little bit more complex, but you're going to encounter it quite a bit um, when you're trying to draw things in perspective, particularly uh, like a cityscape or architecture or something that is kind of blocky and geometric. If you are looking at the corner directly, you're going to need to draw that building in two-point perspective. Three-point perspective is the last category, and this is the most complex perspective. So in this linear perspective, there are three vanishing points, two near the horizon line that are pulling downward, and then one um, above the horizon line, or alternatively, it can also be below. And then these two vanishing points would be kind of pulling it in the opposite direction. In this example, we can see two sides plus a bottom or two sides plus the top. And so the converging lines are going in all sorts of directions. There are converging lines along the edges here that are going up to that vanishing point. There are converging lines defining these edges as well. Um, if you keep following it, there's a converging line. Okay. So these two are defining the sides, and this one is defining um, all the angles that are going up and down. So all of this is pretty abstract when you're first learning about it, but I one thing that you can do that's really cool is you can test this out with a string um, and then two pins. So if you tie a string to a to some pins, the pins act as a vanishing point and the string acts as a converging line. And suddenly those mathematical principles become a lot more concrete. One more thing that I forgot to mention was that in one point and two point perspective, there's always going to be some lines that are going straight up and down that are not at an angle. For example, in this box or this cube that's in two point perspective, this line, this line, this line, this line, and this line are all vertically straight up and down, and then everything else is at an angle. In three point perspective, all of the sides are at an angle. So line of sight is a really important vocabulary word to discuss. And I was talking about perspective helps you understand where you are in relationship to the drawing or it helps you understand where your body is in relation to that drawing. Line of sight refers to the apparent um, or in other words implied position of the viewer to the objects being depicted in the work of art. So you can feel as though, you know, think again about a 2D artwork being a window. In that window, do you feel like you're above the scene, below the scene, or like at your human perspective where you're standing on the ground? So different lines of sight include eye level, bird's eye view, and worm's eye view. Eye level is a perspective where the viewer appears to be on the ground 
looking out, and this is the most familiar human perspective. Bird's eye view is a perspective where the viewer appears to be above the objects. Um, it can also be called God's eye view. So in this perspective, you can see the tops of objects. Um, and oftentimes, this will be a three-point perspective. Because as you can see, everything, all the lines are at an angle. And especially, you can tell with the sides of the buildings how they're going at a slight angle downward. This is three-point perspective. Worm's eye view is also in three-point perspective, and this is a perspective where the objects appear to be large and towering above the viewer from the ground. So you can imagine how these three different perspectives really change the emotional reaction a viewer could have um, to an artwork in this perspective, the viewer may feel in insignificant or small. They may feel that they are a fly on the wall or a little bit voyeuristic, like no one can see them, but they can see something. This one might make them feel like they are a floating spirit or make them feel as though they have control. This one just feels very natural and normal. Um, if you don't want someone to be thinking so much about perspective or you want them to just feel like it, they're in their normal human body, this is a perspective you want to go with. Atmospheric perspective. So we're going to be focusing on this equally in the unit. This is also a scientific sort of theory behind perspective. So this is the gradual lightening of objects as they recede from the viewer due to the filtering effect of air particles. Well, how do air particles change perspective? Air particles can reflect whatever is in the atmosphere, and you can think about them as layers of filters. And so, um, the more air particles there are between you and an object, the more filters you're going to be looking through. And those air particles will, will reflect the light that is in its surroundings. So if it is um, like a sunny day and the sky is blue, then the mountains in this image, if you can imagine it being in color, would be a lighter and lighter and lighter blue as it recedes. Um, and then if it were, if there were a wildfire, I guess, if this is in California, and the sky is red, then it would be the, the opposite. It would just be the mountains are getting redder and redder as you go backwards. And additionally, if there's smoke in the atmosphere, then it might be even harder to see those areas in the background. So the clear, clearer the air is, the more, the further you can see. So there are two main principles with atmospheric perspective and how to use it in your artwork. Um, the further things go back, um, the lighter they become in value, and then also the less distinct they appear or the less details they have. And that refers to the clarity principle. So you can see here um, in, on this mountain, we can see shadows and highlights. And we can also, if we were going to depict this in our drawing, we would use texture lines and contour lines and shading. We can see some details in this area, just slightly right here but everything looks really soft and so we wouldn't want to use very dark contour lines because it would make it appear much closer. And then in here, there's really, we would not include any line work because everything appears to be very soft. So this would be better in soft charcoal or soft um, ink wash. Atmospheric perspective also establishes uh, a foreground, a midground, and a background this being the foreground or what's closest 
this being the foreground or what's closest to us, uh, this being the midground, so it's in the middle, and this area being the background. We can tell also with the vertical placement and the overlapping that certain objects are in front of others. Thus, there are multiple factors in this photograph telling the viewer that there is a, a long distance of space between us and this background, or in this mountain in the back. I'm going to talk also about Eastern perspective, um, because it's also a very important and dominant uh, mode of showing distance and perspective in art. In this example, I have a traditional Chinese ink painting by Fu Baoshi. So this is a more recent painting, but also takes on a very traditional approach to their perspective. Uh, Chinese landscape painting is not the only example of Eastern perspective, but it is a really good example. Chinese landscape paintings, or Eastern art in general, is very atmospheric in nature and uses a lot of negative space and so there's lots of areas where you kind of have to fill in parts with your imagination and kind of let your mind wander. Eastern perspective also uses flattened perspective. They rely a lot on vertical placement and overlapping. Atmospheric perspective is another method that they rely on with the clarity being more prominent in the foreground and then, you know, areas in the background not having line work and being a little lighter in value. This really also helps us understand that there's a long distance between us and this object, but we are closer to this object. Chinese landscape painting refers to a style of Eastern art that started to develop in the 5th century and is still popular. Is highly influenced by philosophies and religions such as Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. Chinese landscape paintings are created in a different attitude. The artist wanted to create the impression of infinite space opening up in front of the viewer. In this genre of painting, the horizon line is not decisive, uh, leaving empty areas in an image that can be filled in by the imagination of the viewer enhances this impression of infinite space space that never ends, whereas space that is completely filled up with objects appears limited. Here I have a side-by-side -side comparison of Western and Eastern perspective. So there's two different methods going on. We have an example of linear perspective, and then we have an example of something called isometric perspective. I-S-O-M-E-T-R-I-C, isometric. We aren't going to learn how to use isometric perspective in this unit, but you see it most often. Um, aside from East, traditional Eastern art, you see isometric perspective a lot in video games where you are, for example, like above a, a landscape or a cityscape and all of the converging lines are just going in one direction. So if you can't, haven't guessed yet, this one is an example of Western perspective because you can see most especially in the gridded area of the floor that the converging lines are going um, gradually at different angles. And so if we were to follow those converging lines all the way out, we would see that the vanishing point is somewhere up here. Okay, or maybe it's like right about there. Everything's meeting about there. With this example of isometric perspective, all of these converging lines, well, they're not converging, but these lines are all parallel. So they would never meet at a definite point. They would all just keep going in the same direction without ever touching, kind of like rays of light. Additionally, Western perspective has more of this feeling of being at the, the eye level line of sight, whereas the isometric perspective makes you feel like you're more at a bird's eye view, like you're hovering above. M.C. Escher is a great example of an artist that uses perspective intentionally in his work, and I'm sure that you're familiar with him. 
M.C. Escher was a Dutch graphic artist who made mathematically inspired woodcuts, lithographs, and mezzotints, so he was a printmaker. Despite wide popular interest, Escher was far along somewhat neglected in the art world, even in his uh, native country. He was 70 before a retrospective exhibition was held, and in the 21st century, he became more widely appreciated, um, showing his uh, artwork across the world. And that happened after he was published in a scientific journal. M.C. Escher's work is very distinctive for its mathematical objects and impossible uh, sort of perspective and explorations of infinity through, again, perspective and tessellations. He did not consider himself a mathematician, but he had a lot of friends that were mathematicians and inspired his artwork. In this piece called Relativ Relativity by Escher, we can see so many examples of perspective and there's multiple perspectives going on. In some of the sections of the work, we feel like we are at a worm's eye view. So here we really feel like we're tiny on the floor and looking upward. And then over here, we feel like we're at a bird's eye view, like we're looking down. In some instances, I feel like I can see things in two-point perspective, like there's a cube right here where I can see the front and the side at the same time. This could be an example of one-point perspective, I, I could see it a little bit better. Then additionally, um, not only is he using different perspectives, but also, and different line of sights, then he's also rotating these different uh, depictions of space and then putting them all together um, so that it really confuses the viewer as to where they are relative to the artwork. In these staircases, it's you feel like you could walk up them and then in these ones you're walking down. So it's just very interesting. Um, it's like a puzzle that you have to figure out and you could just look at it for a very, very long time like a book that you can read over and over again.